Okay, assalamu alaikum everyone. Uh, my name is Rawan Shaar. I'm a fifth year medical student. And today I'll be explaining the deafness lecture that was given by uh, Dr. Khalid. Uh, generally and overall, I want you to remember that this lecture is, since it's a clinical lecture and you're still starting, yani, taking clinical, you're probably only getting like two questions max from this lecture, most likely again. Uh, of course, I'm not sure, but you know, this is the most likely scenario. And trust me, it's a lot more straightforward and easy, uh, easier than you think. Uh, they definitely won't ask complex stuff that's يعني, above your level. I'll uh, focus, يعني, I'll tell you what's most likely going to be asked about, يعني, what the, uh, what's high yield. Uh, but other than that, I'll be mainly explaining things that um, he mentioned that he probably didn't explain that well in the lecture, most likely because it's not يعني, included and it's not your level. But so, no, I'll explain it just so you, you know, be relieved at least, so you understand this information. In the end, you're going to probably take most of this stuff in uh, fifth year when you take ENT. Okay, so uh, these are the objectives. First, we'll cover the physics of sound and auditory transduction. Then we'll go on to uh, the types of deafness, the causes of deafness, and um, those two, I would say, are the more high yield uh, concepts. Uh, then the principles of the tests that are performed to evaluate deafness and the preliminary management plan to treat deafness. These two are probably low yield. I don't know. I don't think they'll ask about it. Best and no, we'll cover it either way. <clears throat> Okay, so I'm skipping the videos because, yani, honestly, they you won't get anything out of them, yani, in the exam other than what I'm gonna talk about. Okay, you all suddenly work on my PowerPoint for some reason. Anyways, so the physics of sound. Okay, there's two ways sounds are measured. Okay, is measured. Uh, you have hertz for measuring the frequency and decibels, which measure the sound power. So when I say frequency. What that means is the vibrations, so the vibrations of the uh, sound waves, okay, and the wave uh, per second, okay, so the number of sound vibrations per second, and the higher the frequency, that means the higher pitch the sound is. So a child screaming, that the sound coming out of their mouth would be a high pitched sound. You would see the frequency pretty high, like this, okay. Um, other uh, sounds that are more yani, low pitched would be long, would have a long wavelength and much lower frequency. Okay. And of course, there are uh, frequency levels that are out of our hearing range. So uh, we can't hear for like either it's too low frequency or of a high, too much of a high frequency. So there's a certain frequency range that we can hear. Okay. Now, in terms of uh, uh, sound power, <clears throat> When I say sound power or sound amplitude, I want you to think of volume. That's what we in real life call volume. So when you increase the volume, that means the sound's pressure or power is increasing. So it's louder, okay? So like here in this diagram, you can see how a jet engine, it has 130 decibels and because it's pretty loud compared to your breathing, which is only has 10 decibels because it's a very soft sound. So it has low power, okay? Um, that's pretty much it. Okay, so when I say sound power and you see decibels, you think of volume, while when you see hertz, you think of the pitch, high pitched or low pitch, okay? This is another video. This is just the test they did to uh, test basically how air uh, sound is conducted through the oscillos. Okay, so this is more important. So I'm pretty sure you took this in your anatomy lectures, but just an overview, because we'll be referring to it. We have um, the ear consists of the outer ear, the middle ear and the inner ear, okay? The outer ear consists of the pina, which is made of cartilage. Then you've got the uh, ear canal, okay? I may also refer to this as the external auditory canal, okay? So it's the same thing. Then you have the middle ear, which is basically this cavity that has a tympanic membrane, okay? And three ossicles or three bones, the malleus, incus, and the stapes, okay? These uh, the stapes, as you know, is the smallest body in your is smallest body, sorry, smallest bone in your body. Okay, this could be like a trivia kind of question. And um, you can see also you have the eustachian tube here. Okay, this is important because it can be um, in uh, the eustachian tube. It's connected to your nasopharynx. Okay, so it connects your knee. It's like a tunnel from your nasopharynx to your middle ear cavity. So anytime you have an upper respiratory tract infection 
uh, it can actually spread to your middle ear because, uh, through the eustachian tube and it can cause otitis media. So that's one way of how kids can have otitis media from uh, respiratory infection, okay? And um, uh, you have your inner ear next, which has your cochlea and your vestibular apparatus. The vestibular apparatus is made of these semicircular canals, which as you know, is uh, responsible for balance. Uh, but if this is impaired, then it could cause vertigo, okay? Vertigo is basically the uh, medical term for dizziness. Uh, meanwhile, the cochlea is responsible for interpreting the sound waves and converting them to electrical waves. And we'll see how it exactly does that in a minute. So sound conduction, how does it work? So you have sound waves and we know sound waves are considered like mechanical waves, okay? So they come into your ear, okay? Through your ear canal, this is one way they can come in. They cause vibrations in the tympanic membrane and this in turn, because it's attached to the ossicle, the malleus, it causes vibration of the ossicles. And then the stapes, which is attached to the uh, cochlea through the oval window, there's like an oval window right here. Um, when it vibrates, it causes the fluid that's in the cochlea to vibrate as well. So the fluid basically travels in these spaces called the scala, okay? The scalas. Here, the fluid here is called the endolymph. The fluid here and here is called the perilymph, okay? So this fluid basically vibrates in response to the uh, vibrations of the stapes. And this in turn stimulates the organ of corti, which is the main organ responsible for interpreting the sound waves and converting them to chemical, then to uh, electrical uh, impulses, okay? So it's converted from mechanical, chemical, then electric. And we see, we'll see the exact يعني, mechanism of doing that in a bit. But so no, that's the purpose of the organ of corti, okay? Uh, the final step is when your auditory branch uh, of your eighth cranial nerve, which is the vestibulocochlear nerve, uh, it gets stimulated by the electrical impulses. Pretty straightforward, okay? Now I put this image because I wanted you guys to have a better يعني, visualization of where the, uh, how have, oh, sorry, how the cochlea cook looks and how the organ of corti is يعني, exactly. So you can see this is the base of the cochlea, okay? So the cochlea is arranged in like a, a pyramid that's spiraled, or if you can, you can also think of it as a, like a long tube that's coiled. So you like coiled it so that it looks like a pyramid. So it goes at the base, it's big, then it becomes narrow, narrow till the, it reaches the top, okay? Till it reaches the top, which is the apex. So the stapes would be here, okay? Once it vibrates, the, so it causes the fluid to vibrate all the way up to the top. And if you cut the cochlea, you'll see the organ of corti right here. And this is the perilymph in the other scalas, okay? the scala vestibule up here and the scala, uh, this is the scala media, and then this is the scala tympani, if I'm not mistaken, because I added these labels, but you should make sure as well. But the most important part here is I just added it so that you can imagine where it is, okay? You can visualize where everything is placed. Another important thing to note is when you look at the organ of corti, you'll see that you have an inner hair cell and then and outer hair cell, outer hair cells, sorry. These outer hair cells are actually arranged in rows. So this, you you see one right here, but there are actually tons along alongside it, okay? So there are actually three rows of outer hair cells. They're all like stretched like this, but it's just because this is not a 3D image, so you can't see them all. While the inner hair cell is arranged in one row, and they, uh, the outer hair cells, they sense the uh, sound waves, and basically what their role is to just amplify the low uh, vo volume or low um, power sounds. So any sound that's like too low to be picked up by the inner hair cells, um, they become amplified by the outer hair cells so that the inner hair cell can pick it up. Okay, that's how I like to remember it. Uh, and then, yeah, you have the cochlear nerve right here, the cochlear fibers, sorry. So you can see it synapses with all of them so that it can interpret the sounds and send electrical impulses to your brain. This is another picture. Um, same thing as I mentioned earlier, okay? This is the histology picture. You can see these are the three rows that I was talking about of the outer hair cells. And then this is the inner hair cell, okay? You can see multiple cells and they're all arranged in one row. Okay, outer hair cells are for amplifying sound. Inner hair cells, they, they have sense receptors. They pick up the sounds. 
this picture is uh, low yield as well. Okay, so he just wanted you to know that the inner hair cells they um, uh, transmit signals to the uh, spiral ganglia type one. This is the type one spiral ganglia, while the outer hair cells transmit signals to the type two uh, spiral ganglia. And this just shows where they go in the brain and which nuclei they synapse to. I don't think he'll ask you about any of this. Now, again, as I mentioned, the function of the outer hair cell is that it amplifies the sounds, okay? So any sound that's low, it amplifies it. And the special thing about them is that, or unique thing that they notice is that it dances with the sound, meaning it um, has this dancing kind of motility because it contracts and elongates along according to the sounds, okay? And this is just a video for it. Um, okay, that's it. Now, for the function of the... Um, inner hair cell this is as i mentioned this is the sense receptor right so it's the main yeah i mean it converts these sound waves into electrical impulses but it does doesn't do that any directly there are multiple steps so the first step is that in the endolymph you have the mechanical waves the sound waves right and the mechanical waves or sound waves they cause a um, the mechanically uh, gated ion channels to open when they uh, deflect the hair cell. So they push the hair cell in this direction, for example, and that kind of opens the gates because of the force. So it's a mechanical force that opens these gates. That's why they're called mechanically gated ion channels. Now, once these gates open, positively charged anions, sorry, ions enter the cell, including potassium and calcium, okay, but mainly potassium. This, of course, causes depolarization of the membrane, but it's not enough that it causes an action potential. It's more of just a receptor potential, okay? Meaning a membrane potential that's happened uh, due to receptor uh, changes uh, and opening, okay? So there's depolarization. This depolarization basically means that the membrane potential became more and more positive, causing the uh, calcium, the voltage-gated calcium channels to open. So the, depo the membrane potential increased to a uh, level a voltage level that opened these calcium gated uh, channels and allowed calcium influx. Then calcium influx caused or triggers the release of vesicles with containing, sorry, excitatory neurotransmitters. So these are neurotransmitters that are being released in response to the increase in calcium, intracellular calcium. So this would be the chemical component, okay? So you got mechanical, chemical, and now the electrical, which is when the neurotransmitter binds to the afferent nerve and then triggers an action potential. And that's how you hear sound, okay? Oops. Like, this is just like I said, okay? Um, okay, so another important thing about the cochlea, as I mentioned, it's spiraled, right? It's spiral shaped. So you got the base and then it coils up until it reaches the apex. So one thing they found out that's interesting is that at the base of the cochlea, that's where all the high frequency sounds are picked up. Meanwhile, at the apex, all the low frequency sounds are picked up. Now, uh, the way that I remember this and how I make myself understand it is by all the high frequency sounds, if you think of it, since they're high frequency, يعني, they're more easily يعني, picked up. So I would assume that it's easy to detect them so that's why the inner hair cells detects them pretty easily in the beginning of the pathway, right? But then as you go, as all the high frequency sounds are picked up, what's remaining are the low frequency sounds. So the low frequency sounds, um, they're picked up at the end, meaning, and I would assume that maybe the outer hair cells, they're amplifying those uh, sounds so that they're picked up more easily, okay? So basically the lowest frequency sound would be heard at the top. Okay, at the apex, because it needs more outer hair cells to amplify it in order for it to be heard. Again, this explanation may not be accurate. Yani, the reasoning behind it may not be accurate, but this is how I make myself understand it or like memorize it. Okay, I don't know if that's the actual explanation. Okay, but what we know is that at the base, high frequency are picked up. At the apex, low frequency are picked up. Okay, why? Because according to me, uh, the outer hair cells need uh, the low frequency ones, sorry, they need more outer hair cells to amplify them, okay, so that they can be loud enough for them to be picked up, okay? This is not really a scientific explanation, as I mentioned, but it's good enough for me to memorize it. Okay, so base, high frequency, apex, low frequency. Now, 
this is the another diagram kind of helps you uh, visualize it as well because i love diagrams they make me understand things this is an uncoiled cochlea so basically they just uncoiled it and stretched it out like as if it's like one long tube you can see in the beginning you have high frequency picked up then it decreases as you go to the apex okay now the types of deafness this is high yield if anything i think the uh, what i mentioned earlier about the frequency at the base and the apex the difference between the frequencies picked up that's probably high yield i think you probably took it in other lectures as well so you'll probably get a question on that from other lectures if not this one another high yield thing would be the types of deafness you need to know the difference between them so what's you have conductive deafness or conductive hearing loss and sensory neural hearing loss what's the difference the difference is that conductive deafness is depends on the pathway that the sound travels okay to get to the cochlea so if there's anything wrong um in the pathway of the sound getting to the cochlea this is due to conductive deafness so for instance if you have um tympanic membrane rupture this is obviously going to affect the vibration of the tympanic membrane so the sound waves might not be transmitted so again this is conductive hearing loss if these bones are like dislocated or they have disorganized growth or they're too stiff they're not vibrating this could be another cause of conductive hearing loss. Why? Because they are not able to vibrate and transmit the sound waves. If in the in a middle ear itself, there's all there's inflammation and like lots of fluid and effusion, again, the uh, bones might not be able to uh, vibrate and the tympanic membrane also might not be able to vibrate. So this could cause conductive hearing loss. So what you need to know is that conductive hearing loss is caused by a pathology in the middle ear or the outer ear or so the external auditory tube or the uh, pina itself for example or not the pina but like anything that affects the external auditory canal or external auditory tube okay so if you have wax clogging your ear that could that's going to cause conductive hearing loss if you if you have uh, atresia atresia of your auditory canal you don't even have a canal that's obviously going to cause conductive hearing loss okay or a tumor in your uh, external auditory canal this could cause conductive hearing loss okay um, so these are examples of uh, diseases like autosclerosis which is when the bones become uh, disorganized like they grow in a disorganized way or uh, spongiosis basically uh, titus media which is inflammation of the middle ear and tympanic membrane perforation these are examples obviously there are a lot more causes as well that's conductive good sensory neural is not about the pathway that the sound travels it's about the target place so the target organ for hearing which is the cochlea so if the cochlea or the auditory nerve gets affected by any disease for example it could be multiple sclerosis it could be a tumor in the auditory nerve or the cerebellopontine angle. It could be a congenital hearing loss that causes uh, degeneration of the auditory nerve or degeneration of the organ of Corti. Um, it could be an inflammation in your meninges. Okay, so meningitis can actually lead to uh, oss ossification of the cochlea, and then it's not obviously it's not going to work. So you're going to have sensory neural deafness. The idea is, what's the where is the pathology? It's in the cochlea or the auditory nerve. So the main difference in these two uh, types of deafness is the localization, where the problem is, okay? That's what I want you to remember. And of course, the third type would be the mixed type, so where you have both uh, impaired. And yeah, here you can see, I think this is an atrophied uh, organ of Corti. But yeah, that's pretty much it, Diani. And as I mentioned, this is mixed hearing loss. Okay. so. The clinical presentation for deafness can be يعني, pretty various. يعني, they're not get, they sometimes they might even like not, not even notice they have hearing loss, but they'll come to you with pain in the ear or block or fullness or a cracking sound, ringing in the ear or noise in the ear. Ringing is also called tinnitus. Uh, discharge, itching, sound localization, meaning uh, they have poor sound localization, so they don't know where the sound is coming from. Or they cannot discriminate in noise, for example. This could be a cause. Sometimes people have problems with speech discrimination because of the hearing loss. So that's another way they can pr uh, present to you. So for the physical examination here, what he wants you to know or to get is that anytime someone presents with hearing loss, the differentials or the causes are kind of endless. It's not always so simple as, oh, he just has wax or he just has uh, otitis media. 
you know, especially if it's a young child, there are so many syndromes, there are so many congenital causes, um, medications, it could be a ton of things, okay? So that's why a thorough examination must be done. So of course you have to do an ENT examination and as well as general uh, physical examination and check their neurological status. So this is how they examine the ear. This is an autoscope. This is what you'll usually see in the clinic in fourth year one, or sorry, fifth year once you go to do the ENT rotation. This is a more advanced um, autoscope. It's called an autoendoscopy. So they actually insert a tube into your, with a camera into your ear rather than looking through it, uh, through the autoscope itself. Uh, this is probably more commonly used in the hospital. Like, I don't think I've ever seen an autoendoscopy in KFSH or any of the hospitals. So for a clinical examination, now this is what you see when you look at through the autoscope usually. You'll see that this is the tympanic membrane. It's usually like pale or grayish. Um, this is kind of the imprintment of the malleus bone. Uh, you'll see a light reflection, and apparently you can vaguely see the stapes here. I can't, but I think it's because it's not high quality. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty. this is how a normal eardrum would look like or tympanic membrane would look like. Now for tympanometry. So tympanometry, uh, this uh, exam, you'll take it again more in depth in fifth year and you'll need to understand it, yani, the results and how to interpret an tymp tympanometry in fifth year. There, He's most likely like 99.99% not going to ask you about it because it's advanced, but like I said, I'll explain it anyway. So for tympanometry, it measures the degree of motility of your tympanic membrane. Like I said, when you need for hearing sound, your tympanic membrane needs to vibrate, right? That means it needs to be able to move. So it needs to be a bit mobile, okay? Uh, so anything that causes the membrane to become stiff or hypermobile, like too mobile, this could affect your hearing. hearing. So that's why they have this tympanometry to it's to evaluate the degree of mobility of your tympanic membrane or just the degree uh, how your middle ear is working basically because it can also directly tell you how the ossicles are as well. We'll see right now. So this is how the tympanogram looks like. So you have the pressure, the increased pressure as in like they they pump in air usually, and as they pump more air, they look at the compliance. So the normal, the normal curve is the A curve right here, the green one. As you can see, as the pressure increases, the compliance will increase at one point, but then at zero. Then at uh, one point, it'll start decreasing when the pressure is too high. It becomes too, uh, it can't move anymore, okay? So basically, this is the normal curve. We just memorized how the curve looks like, honestly. Uh, AD is this red curve, and that's when you, when your uh, membrane is too mobile, so it's highly compliant. And usually what causes that is ossicular discontinuity. So you know those three bones that we uh, saw in the images in the middle ear? If they're like dislocated or something's wrong with them, like they're, they're not in their place, um, it's going to make the membrane very like shaky, basically. It's not in place, okay? Uh, because of the ossicular discontinuity. So the membrane becomes very mobile and loose. Meanwhile, in AS, it's like this yellowish curve right here. This is, you can think of S for stiffness. So this usually happens when the uh, membrane is not able to move as well as it sh normally should. And uh, this, you, you, this could be because of the ossicular stiffness. So the bones have become very stiff and rigid that they're not allowing the membrane to move, okay? Even when there's sound coming in, they're holding the membrane with them because they're so stiff and they're not moving, so they're not letting the membrane to move either, okay? And now for the uh, B curve, which you see right here, this flat one, this usually indicates that there's fusion in the middle ear or that there's tympanic membrane perforation. And you can see, if you do an otoscope, you can easily tell if there's a tympanic membrane perforation unless it's like really small. Uh, but other than that, if you don't tympanic membrane perfusion, that means there's probably a middle ear effusion then. Okay, so B usually indicates two things, either middle ear effusion or tympanic membrane perforation. Again, be either effusion or perforation, the tympanic membrane is not that compliant. It's not going to be moving no matter how much pressure you add, okay, or decrease. So then you have C, the last thing, which is this curve right here that shifted to the left. This usually indicates that there's a retraction of the drum or dysfunction in the eustachian tube. Remember, the eustachian tube is what connects the nasopharynx to the middle ear 
So any dysfunction in it can cause the eardrum to retract. Okay, it's kind of gonna it's gonna be sucked in, kind of. Okay, so uh, that makes it as well um, less compliant, I guess, uh, in at higher pressures. Okay, so it's gonna be less compliant at higher pressures, but more compliant at lower pressures. Um, again, you don't really need to know this. Um, this is just for Yanni, your knowledge, honestly. I don't think he's gonna ask about it. This is another diagram I put just to show you the curves separately. This is the normal, this is the discontinuity one. <clears throat> this is the, the hyper compliant one. This one's a stiff one. So you can see how low it became, okay? This is the one with the fusion or membrane rupture. And then this is the one with the retraction or eustachian tube dysfunction. Then you have the autoacoustic emission test, emission testing. Okay, so this, um, as the doctor mentioned, this is from actually the transcriptions. It just, it's just for picking uh, vibration of the vibrations of the outer hair cells to make sure the outer hair cells are working, um, and it's usually used to screen newborns. Okay, so this is a common, usually used method for newborns that are born with risk factors that make you think of um, hearing loss. Or I'm not sure if they even. I think they do this for all newborns. Actually, um, if not, then it's only for the newborns with risk factors of possible hearing loss. But basically, it's used to screen for hearing loss in newborns because, you know, you can't obviously ask them if they hear the sound or whatever. So they use the autoacoustic emission testing. OK, what does it do? It measures the vibrations of the outer hair cells to see if they're working or not. OK, all this graph stuff, ignore it. I don't think they're going to come. They're going to bring in their exam. Again, I'm sure they, it won't come. Now, <clears throat> audiological testing. Okay, so this uh, exam is more commonly used in adults and children because here you depend on the patient to respond to you, okay? So what happens here is that they start playing a sound at a very low decibel, okay? That means a very low volume, okay? Then they ask the pa pa patient or individual if they hear it or not. So let's say they started at a frequency of 125, okay? And they played it at 10 decibels. They ask him, or five decibels, they ask him, do you hear the sound? He says, no. Then they increase it to 10. Do you hear the sound? Um, if he says yes, then he they mark it right here. That's his hearing. That's this patient's hearing threshold at 125 hertz, okay? If he doesn't hear the sound, then they basically continue increasing it at this level, okay? Till he says, yes, I hear the sound. And that would be their hearing threshold, okay? And they repeat this at every frequency level. So, um, what uh, the normal range would be is that from 20 decibels and below, that's what uh, that's uh, the level you should be, the range that you should be hearing most hertz, okay? Or most frequency hertz, okay? So most of your points on this graph should be within this range, okay? Otherwise, you would be classified as having a hearing loss, either slight hearing loss or moderate or profound if it's in this area, okay? So it's very important to... Um, uh, know that in for the audiogram or this audiological testing, they just they're what they're doing is they're measuring your hearing threshold, which is the softest sound that you can hear at a particular frequency. Okay. Uh, let's see some examples. Okay, so this example right here shows how it actually shows you the ranges, and these ranges can differ from one graph to another. Um, you just need to know that around twenty and below or 15 and below is the normal range. So here you can see this person, most of his points, his hearing thresholds, okay? They're like in between 15 to 30, okay? So it's borderline normal to slight hearing loss, okay? Like we could say that this person has slight hearing loss to normal, okay? But it's not so definitely not severe and definitely not moderate hearing loss, okay? And uh, as I mentioned, profound hearing loss would be in down here, it's actually from 90 to 110. This requires a clear implant, okay? And one thing to note is that in all, all audiograms, the red means that it's the right ear, while the blue is the left ear. So they always measure the right ear alone and then the left ear alone, of course, because sometimes a person can have hearing loss in one ear, other times he can have it in both ears, okay? So they measure ear each ear separately. And how do you know which ear is uh, what? The blue is always the left ear. The red ear, the red is always the right ear. So RR, okay? 
this is uh, another example. Um, here, I wanted to explain the difference between bone conduction and air conduction. So you can see we have lots of symbols, okay? These difference in the circles and X, and you got a, like this greater than sign or arrow. Uh, so this is to differentiate if you're testing air conduction or bone conduction. So in audiological testing, not only do they measure the right ear alone and left ear alone, they also measure air conduction alone and bone conduction alone. Okay, so I'd assume that they typically start, let's say, with the left ear, and they measure air conduction, then they measure bone conduction in the left ear, then they go to the right ear and do the same. Okay, uh, the idea is why do they measure air conduction and bone conduction? So, first of all, air conduction is what we've been explaining since I began the presentation, which is when the sound waves travel through your external auditory tube, uh, they go through your tympanic membrane, vibrate, uh, cause vibration of the ossicles, then reach your cochlea. This is called air conduction. Okay, this pathway is air conduction. Bone conduction is when you hear sound that's coming through a different pathway. And the pathway is what? Bo through your bone. So the sound can also cause vibrations through your bone, your facial bone, okay? And reach the cochlea. So sound waves that are transmitted through this pathway, um, they are said to have bone conduction, okay? So basically we're, what we're saying is that you can hear through two ways, air conduction and bone conduction. Okay, that's why we even have bone implants where you can hear in case there is no hope in you having proper air conduction. Sometimes the doctors put in a bone uh, implant, hearing uh, implant so that you can hear through your bone. Okay, um, why is this important to measure? Because sometimes as well, you can have, um, for example, in conductive hearing loss, right? We said that the pathology is usually either in the external uh, ear outer ear or in the middle ear, okay? So if there's a pathology in the outer ear or in the middle ear, what would it affect? Would it affect air conduction or bone conduction? Obviously it would affect air conduction, right? Because it's in your outer ear and middle ear path, which is the pathway that air needs to travel to, okay? But bone does not does not care about the outer or the middle ear. It goes directly through to your cochlea. So it's not, it's gonna be normal. So in a person with conductive hearing loss, his bone conduction is usually normal while air conduction is impaired. That's why we need to measure both because we wanna know if this person has pure conductive hearing loss or not. If he has pure conductive hearing loss, as I mentioned, air is abnormal, bone is not normal. Why would air be affected? Because again, conductive hearing loss is caused by either tympanic membrane rupture or wax impaction. It's things that are affecting the outer ear or middle ear, which is needed by the air conduction. However, in any case where the cochlea is affected, okay, either due to meningitis or whatever, tumor, anything, the cochlea or auditory nerve is affected, then what will happen? Both bone and air conduction will be affected because both of them, they need the cochlea for you to hear, right? So both of them will be impaired in sense neural hearing loss, okay? So that's the important uh, difference or that's an important reason for why we need to measure both, okay? Now, these are more examples. So you can see here we have conductive hearing loss. This is an audiogram showing conductive hearing loss. So these symbols represent bone conduction and these symbols represent air conduction, okay? Uh, the ENT residents and ENT doctors, they have this memorized. So that's why when they see this, they right away know that this is air conduction and this is bone conduction. This is the blue, again, left ear. This is the right ear, okay? Same thing here. So when they see this, they know, okay, so air conduction, which is this, it's way above 20. Their hearing threshold is way above 20, right? That means he could only hear at 40 decibels, decibels or more. He could not hear at 10, 20, or 30, or 40, or 30, okay, for air conduction, okay? So his air conduction is clearly impaired because it's out of the normal range, okay, which is here and below. Meanwhile, bone conduction, it's around the normal range. I know it's, some of it is above 20, like here, but let's pretend it's in the, it, they're all completely in the normal range. So I would say that this is conductive hearing loss because bone conduction is normal and air conduction is impaired. And you have, as a result, you have this air bone gap, okay? That's an important uh, feature of pure conductive hearing loss. So this person, I would say he has bilateral 
both left and right conductive hearing loss, okay? So impaired air conduction, normal bone conduction, and an airborne gap. Airborne gap. Meanwhile, this patient, you can see how all the hearing thresholds at all frequency levels is above 20, right? For both air and bone. This means that both air conduction and bone conduction are impaired and there's no air bone gap, right? So that means it's pure sensory neural hearing loss. And that's pretty much it for interpreting the audiogram. I know, again, that you're definitely not getting this in the exam unless something happened over the years where since I was in second year and they changed it. But uh, I highly doubt you guys will get this because we got this in fifth year. Yeah, and it's very clinical and not really second year level. But this is just for you guys to understand and, you know, for you to learn more. Okay. This is uh, another um, image that he put just to explain uh, air conduction versus bone conduction. Here you can see he's put an earbud to test air conduction. He's testing the air, um, the sound waves measuring, uh, sorry, entering through your external ear, to your middle ear, to your cochlea. Here he's testing bone conduction because he put the implant or the device on your bone directly and it's picked up, travels through your bone to it gets to your cochlea. This is just a Bluetooth bone conduction uh, headset, okay? Just for you to see how it looks like. This is again explaining the air bone gap, which I mentioned. <clears throat> okay, this is uh, this graph would indicate what? Normal hearing, right? Because the hearing thresholds, this is all for the right ear, by the way. Okay, so this is all right ear only. You don't see any blue. That means this gram, this audiogram is only for the right ear because it's red. And the hearing thresholds for both air and for bone are below 20, meaning he has a normal right ear hearing. Okay, so he has normal right ear hearing. Meanwhile, in this patient, his right ear, his right ear bone conduction is normal. So it's below 20, while his ear conduction is above 20, right? His hearing threshold is above 20, meaning he has an air bone gap, impaired air conduction. This is conductive hearing loss. This is another patient here. He's testing the left ear because it's blue. Okay, blue means left. Here, both the air conduction, which is the X. No, sorry, the this is kind of confusing the symbols because they're not, okay, this, this is bone conduction, okay? This weird shape, okay? And the X is the air conduction, okay? So they're all below 20. Sorry, they're all above 20. So, and there's no air bone gap. So both bone and air conduction are impaired. Uh, that means sensory neural hearing loss, okay? Now, uh, mixed hearing loss. So mixed hearing loss, you'll see, again, it's both air and bone conduction impaired, right? And, uh, but this time you'll see an air bone gap. So that's a special thing. In sensory neural hearing loss, you had impaired air and bone, but there was no bone gap, okay? While in mixed hearing loss, there is an air bone gap. So what this means is both bone and both air are impaired, but the air conduction is impaired more than the bone conduction. Okay, that's why there's an airborne gap. So this is mixed sensory, uh, sorry, mixed hearing loss. This is another, this is in the, again, right ear, this is the left ear. So this is a slide to show you something important that they also do while doing uh, audiological testing, which is called masking. So it's important that when you're testing one ear, you mask or block the other ear because you don't want the patient to access it. If you play a sound, it might show on the, he might, or he might hear it. He might hear it because the other ear interfered, the ear that you're not testing. So let's say you're testing the left ear and you play a sound. He might hear it because he, he picked it up from his other ear, the, un, the ear that you're not testing Aslan, okay? So this could obviously cause an interference with your results. And that's why you do masking. You need to mask the ear that you're not testing so that you can make sure that your results are accurate, okay? And that you're only testing that ear. And this is a video you guys can watch to see that. Okay, now they have another thing called the speech audiogram. So here it's kind of similar, except you're not playing sounds. You're more like you're saying words, monosyllabic words. 
And this is for determining if they can have uh, speech discrimination. So sometimes there are certain syllables that they can't hear or that they hear differently because of hearing loss. So what you do is I, uh, you read out these words and if they get uh, below 50% of these, so if they hear, if they don't hear, uh, or sorry, if they hear less than 50% of these words correctly, then this is a uh, profound hearing loss. But if they're able to hear 50% or more correctly, then this is normal. Uh, maybe, it's, sorry, it could be hearing loss, but it's uh, not profound, okay? So that's what he's saying here. He's saying below 50%, that's profound hearing loss. He doesn't have proper speech discrimination at all, so he needs a cochlear implant. Okay, and if you wanna understand this graph, as you can see, higher frequency sounds, examples of them would be an airplane. So airplane is really loud because it's 120 decibels and it's high frequency. Meanwhile, a dog's barking, it's, it's at 70 decibels, so it's not that loud and it's low frequency. A truck is really loud, but it's low frequency, low pitch, okay? So that's just showing you examples of different sounds. Now the auditory brainstem or evoked response audiometry, this is kind of like uh, what you guys took in neuro EEG. Uh, you have EEG for your brain, it measures your brain waves. Meanwhile, the auditory brainstem measures your auditory nerve waves. So the waves that are sent to your uh, uh, brainstem and to your auditory nerves. So you can see it goes through your auditory nerve, cochlear nucleus, the upper olive, you know, the parts of your brain, the pathway for the electrical impulses that go from your auditory nerve to all the nuclei in your brain. Again, not high yield, they won't ask you about it, but it's just for you to know, you know, this is another way they can measure your hearing, okay? And this is how it looks like. Again, this is very advanced. Um, we didn't even take this in detail in fifth year. We ju they just mentioned it briefly and only like residents and consultants would actually need to use this, yeah, or would use this and would understand it, of course, very well. But yeah, he just put it there so you guys are aware of the different ways you can, uh, hearing is conducted, is tested, sorry. Uh, these are radiological uh, images of um, the um, <clears throat> temporal bone and your uh, cochlea as well. Uh, you can see that this is a normal cochlea, okay? Oops. Here, again, he's, he's focusing on the MRI of the temporal bone and trying to show how a normal cochlea looks like. Again, I don't think he'll get you any of these images, okay? This is just for your knowledge. Uh, you can see here, this is an ossified cochlea, okay? It's much, it's like very dark. Uh, this is due to meningitis, okay? Uh, Post-meningitis meningitis can basically cause it to ossify. Um, this is also post-meningitis. You can see no fluid in the cochlea or semicircular canals. This is the cranial nerves that are present. Okay, so this is more important, okay? So these images, low yield, he's not gonna get them most likely. What he might get is, for example, which of the following is a cause of conductive hearing loss or which of the following is a cause of sensory neural hearing loss? These are the type of questions he might ask you. So you need to know these examples. So for conductive hearing loss, you have earwax, which is the mo probably the most common cause. It is actually the most common cause of conductive hearing loss. Um, it's when you have lots of wax in your ear that it basically clogs your ear. Or for foreign body, lots of kids can put small objects in their ear. Uh, ear infection is a common cause of conductive hearing loss, uh, either due to otitis externa or media or cholesteatoma. As you can see, these are all things that affect either your middle, middle ear or outer ear, nothing that affects your inner ear, okay? Uh, perforated eardrum, either due to infection, trauma, surgery, or even those cotton swabs you use for your ear, it can cause perforation. Uh, if you have any uh, anything that causes uh, loss of the middle ear ossicles, so it could be a congenital cause where you don't have your your you don't develop an uh, stapes or malleus or incus, this could cause conductive hearing loss, or it could be due to trauma or infection. This could cause again conductive hearing loss. Another cause is autosclerosis, where the bones um, in your middle ear they grow in in a disorganized way and they become very stiff. Um, congenital atresia, where you don't have an ear canal. This is another cause of conductive hearing loss. And finally, tumor osteoma. Remember, this tumor would be either in your outer ear canal or in your middle ear, okay? It would not be in your inner ear because if it was in your inner ear, it would cause sensory neural hearing loss, not, out, not conductive, sorry. Okay, so here he just wanted to talk more about the wax, uh, how wax causes a conductive hearing loss. As you know, wax is 
formed by your um, your uh, hair follicles, okay? And it's basically made for trapping bacteria and dust and any other microorganisms and any foreign particles, okay? So it's preventing them from, it's protecting your ear basically. And uh, sometimes if it um, builds up or if you usually, if you use the cotton swabs and you push them too much, it can cause impaction, okay? This is a perforated eardrum, okay? This can cause again, conductive hearing loss. This is a cholesteatoma, which is basically uh, when uh, skin uh, cells start to grow, uh, so there's an overgrowth of epithelial cells. And uh, this is actually common in KFSH. You'll see, we've seen lots of cases of it. It looks like a pearly, like whitish uh, uh, tumor that grows in, your, in the outer ear, okay? And it causes conductive hearing loss. Uh, this is atresia of the inner of the ear. You can see there's no, he does not even have an outer ear canal. So, or outer uh, external auditory canal. So what they can do is they can implant a bone uh, implant, a bone hearing aid so that he can hear through bone conduction. Okay. And he, they put a plastic ear pina just for, you know, cosmetic purposes as well. Uh, autosclerosis, as I mentioned, it's a pathological growth that happens in the bones. So they start to form spongy bone and uh, it would cause, again, it would make the bones really stiff and it would cause uh, conductive hearing loss, okay? Here you can see an airborne gap again, you know, bone conduction, normal conduction affected. So again, this would be conductive hearing loss. This is the treatment for autosclerosis. Uh, you can use a hearing aid or they can do stepidectomy as well. Uh, usually, I think this management is stepidectomy aslan. Um, they basically remove the stapes muscle, uh, stapes bone, sorry, and it's replaced with an implant or prosthesis. Um, and yeah, that's how it's uh, usually treated. Um, if I'm going too fast, if there are things yeah, any that you guys feel like you want more information on, text me, feel free to text me and everything. I'm just going, I'm, the slides that I'm going over really fast are low yield. That's why I'm, you know, I mean, rushing through them. Anyways, osteoma of the external ear canal. This is another cause of conductive hearing loss. Okay, you can see this is the tumor. It's growing here. It's blocking air conduction. So again, air conduction would be affected. Bone conduction would not be affected. Okay, sensory neural hearing loss. The most common cause of sensory neural hearing loss is genetic or congenital, okay? Genetic syndromes like Down syndrome, Alport syndrome, there's jarville lynch nielsen syndrome. There are so many syndromes that can cause hearing loss. That's why uh, screening, hearing screening at uh, when babies are born is important, especially in Saudi Arabia with lots of the, with the consanguinity. Uh, you have other causes can be idiopathic or non-genetic, which are acquired like age-related hearing loss. This is also a very common uh, cause of hearing loss, sensory neural hearing loss to be specific. Um, so as you know, with elderly, you tend to have to like raise your voice for them to hear you. And that's because the outer, their outer hair cells have become degenerated. So in normal human body, this is a normal change with aging that the outer hair cells progressively degenerate. And as I mentioned before, outer hair cells, their purpose is to amplify the low sounds, low frequency sounds. So um, not low frequency, low volume sounds, basically. So because they don't have the outer hair cells anymore, any soft sounds, they won't be able to hear them properly because they don't have the outer hair cells to amplify those sounds so that they can hear them. That's why you have to really raise your voice for elderly to hear you, okay, because of this degeneration. So this is called perspicusis, which is age-related hearing loss, okay? This is a, something high yield that he could ask you about as well. Or it could just be in the scenario and he could say, you know, oh, what is it caused by? Okay, other causes would be trauma, prolonged exposure to loud noises. Yeah, or something like bear, uh, sorry, bear trauma would cause, um, depending on the cause, it could either cause conductive hearing loss or sensory neural, depending on what it affects exactly. But we know sensory neural hearing loss, if the, it happens when the cochlea or the auditory nerve is affected, okay? Viral infections, yeah, you probably, Took this in uh, POD, the torch infections, you know, toxoplasma, rubella, measles, mumps, um, uh, CMV, a lot of them actually cause sensory neural hearing loss in the baby because they get this infection during pregnancy. Um, Meniere's disease is something that actually um, can cause sensory neural hearing loss. Acoustic neuroma, which is basically a tumor in your um, 
uh, cerebellopontine angle. So between the cerebellum and the pons, um, you can have a tumor called acoustic tumor. It basically affects your vestibulocochlear nerve, cranial nerve eight. So that's how they present with sensory neural hearing loss. Okay. Uh, meningitis, a common scenario would be, for example, um, a child and who's unvaccinated and he's presenting with uh, hearing loss and he has a history of meningitis. So you think of H influenza type B, okay? Uh, it's common cause of hearing loss in uh, and meningitis in kids, okay? Encephalitis is also another cause, multiple sclerosis and stroke. Uh, other causes would be medication, like chemotherapy, aminoglycosides. These are autotoxic medications. And as I mentioned before, acoustic neuroma, okay? So what's the important part of all these causes? They affect the cochlea or the auditory nerve or wherever, at whatever point of the auditory nerve. But the idea is, is they're the ones that are affected. The outer ear, middle ear are not affected in pure sensory neural hearing loss. Okay. Now... This is the, the high-risk register. So basically, any baby that presents with these um, uh, risk factors must be screened for hearing loss. So if he has a family history of permanent childhood sensory neural hearing loss, or if he's a preterm baby, if he had an in utero torch infection, if he has craniofacial anomalies, you'd immediately think of a, a syndrome. So he might have Down syndrome or Patau syndrome or Edwards. These are all syndromes that could cause hearing loss. So you should screen for hearing. Uh, if he had uh, hyperbilirubinemia or if he had persistent pulmonary hypertension, these are all basically risk factors for hearing loss. So any child or sorry, any newborn that presents with these things or has these things, you should screen them for uh, hearing loss. Okay. Now, Meniere's disease. Uh, also, I don't think you need to memorize these, by the way. I doubt he's going to ask you about them, Yanni. You know, if this, need, if this baby needs hearing loss or not. But Yanni, you can read them, okay? Now, Meniere's disease. Meniere's disease is basically caused by the um, endolymph, increase in endolymph pressure uh, due to atrophy of the organ of corti. So you can see here, the organ of corti, usually it's in this area, and it's supposed to be like a bit high, you know, it's like a bit taller. Uh, but in here, it's atrophied. And uh, in response, there is dilation of the scala. And the endolymph is basically the endolymph fluid that's here. It exerts a high pressure due to the accumulation of fluid. And this affects the, obviously, so the organ of corti is affected, the cochlea is affected. This would cause sensory neural hearing loss, but it also causes actually vertigo and tinnitus as well. And this is usually a common triad that would indicate Meniere's disease, okay? Actually, we I diagnosed this like literally a couple of weeks ago in the ER. A woman came, she had like severe dizziness and it was really bothering her. She would see the room spinning basically every in episodes. I asked her, do you have ringing in your ear? She said, yes. Are you having trouble hearing or any sort of difficulty hearing? And she said, yeah, I do. Obviously, I don't know if this is um, just by asking this question. I can't tell if it's sensory neural hearing loss or uh, conductive. But since she had the vertigo and tinnitus, the highest differential would be Meniere's disease. Of course, you need to rule out other causes as well. But yeah, this is a usual triad for Meniere's disease. And it's good to know this information because it'll probably repeat um, later on in your studies. Okay, these are um, <clears throat> other causes, I guess, or uh, basically he wanted what he wanted to say in this slide is the, how the autosomal recessive causes are common in Saudi Arabia. And in general, autosomal recessive diseases, Assam, they're common in Saudi Arabia because of consanguinity and all the um, marriages that happen between families. So because of that, children end up with more autosomal recessive diseases, and a lot of those diseases are associated with hearing loss, okay? And uh, yeah, this is a list of things, list of dysfunction abnormalities that can be associated with hearing loss. You can have uh, any time you see a child with craniofacial malformations, dental abnormalities, ocular, renal defects, cardiac abnormalities, endocrinologic, skeletal. All these systems can be associated with hearing loss. That's why it's important to, um, if someone's presenting with hearing loss, you look for these abnormalities. Or if someone's presenting with one of these abnormalities, you also look for hearing loss. Okay, so it works both ways. Uh, again, I don't think he's going to ask you about the slide. 
these are examples of syndromes and what other problems they're associated with. So Alpert syndrome is known to be associated with uh, kidney problems. It causes, uh, if I'm not mistaken, glomerular nephritis. Uh, it affects the basement membrane and the glomerulus. Um, but yeah, the idea is that it's associated with kidney problems and hearing loss. You also have pendant syndrome, which is associated with uh, thyroid gland enlargement. Usher syndrome is also associated with vision impairment. And Jarvel lynch nielsen syndrome, which I mentioned earlier, can cause arrhythmias in the heart and QT prolongation. Okay, so um, it's also associated with hearing loss. Okay. And these are syndromes that are associated with hearing loss, Patau, Edwards, and Down, and also trisomy 22. These are examples of hearing aids. You've got a digital one. You've got one with battery. Just for you to know, again, these are also other types of hearing aids. Um, generally, the treatment for conductive and mixed hearing loss uh, for chronic ear diseases would be systemic antibiotics and topical ear drops. You can also have surgical treatment. And um, of course, each cause has its own way of managing it, but I guess this is the general treatment. Either way, I don't think he's going to ask you about this. Usually management questions, they're not asked in second year, um, at least for clinical lectures usually. Um, but yeah, I don't think he'll ask you about this. Okay, so for hearing implants, you got uh, different levels of intervention. So you can have a, a hearing aid, okay, that's usually inserted outside here. You can have a bone anchored hearing aid. So we saw that in a couple of images before where they have an implant right here. You can have a middle ear implant. So they put it right here, okay. Uh, you can have a uh, cochlear implant where they put, uh, put it in the, obviously in the inner ear, or you can even have a brainstem midbrain implant. And of course, um, as you go inside, it becomes more invasive and obviously there are higher risks of infection and other problems. That's why most people, Aslan, they start with hearing aid. They don't start with a brainstem or midbrain implant. This is a cochlear implant and this is how it looks. You can see how it inserts into the cochlea. It goes right there. Okay, pretty cool to look out, Yanni. And that is all. Uh, thank you guys for watching or listening. I really hope uh, it helps you. I really don't want you to stress about this lecture. Like I said, I'm pretty sure you're going to get two questions max from this lecture. And um, just focus on the ones that I, uh, the slides that I said are important. Other than that, if you have other lectures that are more high yield, like anatomy or pathology, I'd focus on that. And um, yeah, just focus on the things that I said high yield. Don't stress a lot about the images or about the tests, like the audiogram and panometry. Uh, in the end, that's just for your knowledge, just for you to know. And don't hesitate to ask me any questions. That's it. Thank you for watching.